The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Um, before we get started, we just want to make sure that everybody on the webinar is able to hear us. The way we could tell that you can hear is if you would please just raise your hand using the hand icon. Okay, perfect. All right, so welcome and thank you for attending the joint stakeholder meeting for the Office of Occupational Therapy, Office of Respiratory Therapy Licensure, Office of Speech, Language, Pathology Certification, and Office of Surgical Assistant and Surgical Technologist Registration via webinar today. Before we get started, we, we would like to introduce the staff members from the Division of Professions and Occupations that are present. My name is Elena Kemp. I am a regulatory coordinator with the division. Also attending with me is Ophelia Duran. She's the program director for respiratory therapists and speech language pathologists. Um, hopefully, oh, also we do have Zen Mayhew. He is the program director for occupational therapists and surgical assistants and surgical technologists. And Laura Bravo, she's a policy analyst. In compliance with the governor's orders regarding COVID-19, the division has transitioned to a platform that is 100% virtual, and we appreciate your flexibility. As many of you have been to DORA's stakeholder meetings before, we would like to reiterate the importance of your comments today. DORA makes decisions every day that may affect your life and your business. So it's vital for, for us to get your input in the rulemaking process. Throughout this process, our main goal is to create regulations that clarify and explain legislation, ensure minimum competency to enter and continue to practice, and provide only what is necessary for consumer protection without unnecessary barriers to the marketplace. Your input will be part of the information that goes to the director as she considers permanently adopting the emergency licensing rules related to COVID-19. More specifically, for occupational therapists, we're looking at rule 1.18. For respiratory therapists, we're looking at rule 1.9. And for speech language pathologists, we're looking at rule 1.20. Um, this hearing is, or this stakeholder meeting is for uh, four boards and programs, but Surgical assistants and surgical technologists, we don't actually have draft rules attached to the notice for them because they didn't have um, emergency licensing rules, but we did want to include them in this conversation just in case there was something that the division missed and maybe there is something that needs to be changed in the rules or considered for permanent rulemaking regarding COVID-19. So if anybody was wondering, that's the reason for that. This meeting is being recorded and it'll be posted online at a later date. As the stakeholder meeting is recorded uh, by webinar solely, we would ask that you please raise your hand using the hand icon if you would like to speak and we'll unmute your line so you can be heard by everyone. Or you can type your comments or questions in the question section and we'll just read those aloud. Before we start taking comments, I wanna ask that everybody providing comments to please state your name and who you represent, if any. Feel free to provide either general comments on the rule changes or specific comments on the proposed language. Please try to keep your comments limited to three to five minutes or less, and try not to repeat something that was already said. Stating you're in full agreement with somebody else is totally fine and it will be noted. Um, if you are using the audio through your computer, please remember to put any phones on vibrate or turn them off. And whether you're using audio on the computer or phone audio, please try to keep background, background noises to a minimum when you're speaking. And before we do start taking comments, I just wanted to give a little context um, as we found that to be a little bit helpful in one of our previous stakeholder meetings. So this meeting is regarding the, the licensing, the emergency licensing rules that were adopted um, to effectuate Executive Order D-2020-038. That was issued on April 15th and it was effective for 30 days. Then that order was extended by Executive Order D-2020-064 and that was extended for another 30 days. And now we're on the third executive order, 
to extend these same rules for another 30 days. And that was issued on June 12th. So basically where we're at with this process is we're just trying to see if there is a need or a want to make these temporary licensure rules become effective. Um, they are going to stay effective as long as the governor continues to issue the executive orders, but we're just trying to test the waters and kind of get feedback to see how the public is feeling about actually making these permanent. So Laura, if you would like to call on some stakeholders, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, again, in order to speak, you can raise your hand. Um, otherwise, you can send in a question or uh, send a comment or a question via the question feature of the webinar. Um, I'm not seeing anyone with their hand raised or any questions at this time, so we'll go ahead and give it a few minutes. Um, again, we're looking for specific language changes for these proposed um, rules and or general feedback regarding whether or not um, you think they should be um, continued or, or not. So again, you can use the raise your hand feature if you'd like to speak so everyone can hear you or you can send a comment or a question via the questions pane. The director um, for each program will consider all comments when making a decision regarding continuation of these rules. So we would appreciate your feedback. All right, I see a question, let me get it. All right, so the question is from Beth Cole, and it says, what is the thinking behind making these rules permanent? Elena, I'm not sure if you're able to address that um, any more than you did just now regarding where we stand um, in the process. Yes, so yeah, once again, it's, um, we're really just testing the public to see if, if there is a desire to make these rules public or permanent, sorry. Um, as of right now, the executive orders are making them, you know, permanent, but we're just trying to see if people want to keep these rules. So it's, there's not anything like in the division or that the director is con um, like currently considering. We're just putting it out to the public to see if there's a desire. Okay, thank you. Um, Beth Cole, if that addresses your question, or I see your follow-up is what would be the pros and cons? Um, I think that's what we're looking for the stakeholders. So you all to provide us feedback on is what would be the pros and cons of this? What, you know, if you have a preference one way or the other, um, this is a stakeholder forum to get your input. Um, you know, the, the director will consider the, the input as, as she makes decisions. Um, I don't know, Elena, if you have further comments regarding the, the question, which is what would be the pros and cons? That was Beth Cole's second comment. No, I, I don't. I think you, you hit it on the head. Okay, thank you. Um, so I see a hand raised, uh, Janice Hines. I see, I, I'm gonna read off the comment you just sent and then I'll go ahead and unmute you. Um, so the comment from Janice Hines is per AOTA, 46 states have a temporary permit option for occupational therapy practitioners. Uh, Janice, I do see your hand is raised, so I've yep. unmuted your line if you want to elaborate. Hi, thank you. This is Janice Hines. Um, I am somebody who has personally and professionally been opposed to having a temporary um, permit for years because I was in a situation that I had to supervise somebody who had a temporary license that was issued before they passed the national boards. So they had completed school. Um, they were in the process of applying for and taking their national exam. When they did not pass the national exam, that state then revoked their temporary permit, you know, right then. It was a really difficult situation to be in as the supervising licensed occupational therapist. Um, so, I personally have um, conflicting concerns that really are more for who the licensed person would be who is giving the supervision for 
you know, the um, kind of the temporary person. That said, um, mm -hmm. 46 states, you know, do this, that there it must, it must kind of end up working out. So um, I don't have a I don't have anything strong. So I guess those are my two kind of things that having been in a situation that was very difficult and made more so by the employer as far as pressuring me to do whatever. And as a licensed practitioner, that's my license. I don't I don't want to be pressured by an employer to supervise somebody who um you know, in essence, isn't their own practitioner legally. And yet I feel like okay. Colorado kind of needs to also, you know, get up with the times. Um, so I think that okay. that you know, quote devil is in the details about, you know, the reinstatement of it and how long it goes on and any complaints that are made during, you know, that temporary license kind of time. And there are procedures in this um, executive order and in this, um, you know, rulemaking process. Okay, thank you for that. Do you have any specific suggestions that would help um, alleviate your concerns, or would you say you're more just opposed to the idea of the temporary licensure at this point due to your concerns regarding being the supervising licensee? Part of it is you, Dora regulates the individual practitioners and not the employers. I think there ha if there is a way that um, individual licensees who are in supervisory um, positions for the temporary licensees, if there is a, um, a process, kind of a safe place that they can contact Dora to say, you know, my employer is trying to put me in this position, blah, blah, blah. How do I handle it? Um, might be one strategy that um, helps the practitioner, you know, stay ethical and legal in what they're doing. Um, you know, if, if somebody is struggling with a temporary license, if, if they're struggling in their practice, ultimately that, you know, is against consumer protection. Um, so having having some kind of place where somebody could seek some additional assistance may be helpful. And people will use it or they won't use it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna see if I have any other hands raised. Don't see any other hands raised. I see a written comment kind of had comments come in, and so I'll go ahead and read that. Nicole Burned says, I am an educator in a respiratory therapy program. If I understand D2020038 properly, the temporary licenses are only allowed for graduates of programs. We had hoped that seniors in respiratory therapy programs could have a temporary license so they could start working to help with COVID-19 issues while also getting their required clinical hours for their coursework. Since hospitals and I just scroll, hold on. Since hospitals and clinical sites are not allowing students, we were hoping to have some alternate options to get them experience so they could eventually graduate. Thank you for that, Nicole. Elena, did you catch that? Do you need additional clarification? No, I, I just I'm yeah. sorry, I missed um, the first portion when you were reading what that uh, state comment was about. What program? It's respiratory respiratory therapy. Oh, okay. Just gonna make sure that I. And so the substantive part of that is related to they had hoped that seniors in respiratory therapy programs could have a temporary license so they could start working to help with COVID-19 issues while also getting their required clinical hours for their coursework. Since hospitals and clinical sites are not allowing students, we were hoping to have some alternate options to get them experience so they could eventually graduate. Oh, I see. 
Okay. Um, if you have further follow-up, uh, Nicole Byrne, feel free to send another question um, or raise your hand and I can unmute your line. Let's see if anybody else would like to speak at this time. I don't see anybody else at the moment. We can give it a few minutes here. Feel free to raise your hand if you would like to speak and I can unmute your line. Okay, we have one. Uh, Catherine Boeda. I might have mispronounced your name, I apologize. Oh, Catherine. Sorry. Well, it cut out. It's Kathy Boada. Okay, you're, you're on, so you, go ahead and speak. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm actually the director for audiology, speech, and learning services here at Children's um, Colorado. And um, I, my question was, and just looking at this, and I remember looking at this very quickly, but this was uh, really to just allow the new graduates to have a quick temporary license, correct? Not someone moving in from out of state to have a temporary license for 120 days while they um, applied for the full door license. Is that correct? I'm just asking, is it, does it only apply to new graduates? Right. Um, I'm sorry, I, Ophelia, I don't know if you could weigh in on that, but I, looking at the rules. Sure, I'm happy to. Hi, this is Ophelia Duran, and I'm the program director for the speech language pathology program. The way the language is written in the emergency rule for the um, for temporary licenses is that it it is intended for new graduates. I think there was a different um, process for out of state licensed speech language pathologists. Okay. Um, but the rule just talks about new graduates for this purpose. Okay, and so that um, really would be that provisional certification anyway, since they have to uh, complete their fellowship. Um, or I must, I, it, otherwise the first part of the language to me doesn't seem like it would apply to anyone uh, other than maybe a new person, a new fellow who's completed their fellowship would apply for that temporary um, license certification. Otherwise, I would say that there's not a need for it. Um, I just, I, I don't know if you had very many people at all apply under this rule. I know we don't have to use it again. ourselves. Okay, but the um, rules, the way they were written, um, and, and the ones that we are considering are it looks like there's two temporary licenses. One is for the actual, one is a temporary speech language pathology license, and then one is a temporary provisional certification. So, and, and so the way I would see it being very helpful for us here at um, both for our inpatient team and our outpatient, um, which is across the state from Pueblo to North, um, you know, um, Northern Colorado, um, would be if we had someone coming from out of state that we hired, if they could get a temporary certif cert um, certification to be able to start work right away at, while they were in the application process for the full DORA, um, that would help. I could see that helping. Otherwise, I don't see a reason for this first one, the 1 1.20. Um, you're not going to have a new grad go directly into a temporary certi certification holder. Um, it would be that second piece further down, which would be the provisional license. Uh, I mean, provisional certificate. Okay. Thank you. So I think what you're saying is you don't see a need for Rule 1.20 unless it's expanded to include folks coming across state lines who have a certification Correct. in another state. Okay. Correct. So I'm not sure we were capturing that correctly. Um, do you have any input on the other um, rule that's been proposed regarding the provisional and how that is set up? 
Um, I, I think for the provisional, uh, that would be fine that they could apply for that um, immediately and the expectation, I could see that being um, used. I don't know whether you've had anyone, but again, it might be too short of a time and given this time, uh, many folks are graduating truly in May or August. And so I don't know that you would have seen very many of these anyway. Um, but at that point, I think this one, perhaps if your focus is only new grads, this would be the only one that would apply. So generally you would support the continuation of this rule, Part D? Yes, that, I, I think that would be fine. It's for the 120 days. And um, then it seems to me that you would, they would still be submitting their application as if that's, uh, if I'm correct in how I read it. And, and um, honestly, I haven't reread it since it came out other than what's on the screen now. Um, and I know that we haven't necessarily used it, but like I said, all new grads would be joining us about now. Um, okay. Thank you. So Do you have any other comments that we would like us to record uh, no. for the director con to consider? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Laura. This is Ophelia. I just uh, mm -hmm. got word that there was likely a handful of, of um, applicants for the temporary licensure. So I just want to extend a thanks for the feedback. Okay, thank you. If anybody has any follow-up on that based on that information, please feel free to raise your hand or send a uh, question uh, or comment in the questions pane. I'm gonna look for other folks who have their hand raised or any of written comments. I'm not seeing any at the moment. We'll hang on for a couple minutes so people think about it and let you consider. I want to make sure we get everybody who wants to comment, um, you know, recorded, um, or we can take your written comments. Elena, do you want to cover next steps while we're waiting to see if anyone else wants to comment? Just sure. Somebody else does. Okay. Sure thing. Um. Me. No, my nose. And now you can. I'll, I'll check back in and let you know if we see I see anybody else. But right now I'm not seeing anyone with a hand raised or any written comments of coming in. Come in. So I'll let you know if I see one though. So check back in before we sign off. Or otherwise, oh yeah. Okay. Maybe we should just give a few more minutes just in case the folders okay. are mid typing. All right. We can hang on then for a few minutes. So again, we're looking for you know any specific language changes or general support or um, opposition to these temporary rules for any of the programs that were included in the notice. Um, the director would appreciate your uh, input to to get an understanding of where everyone stands on these in the process. You can use the raise your hand feature if you'd like to speak, or you can send a comment or a question via the questions pane. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes in case folks are gathering their thoughts. And if you have a thought after we sign off on the webinar, uh, Elena will be providing information of how to provide written comments separately as well. Um, so this isn't your final chance, but you know we would like to get any feedback you have at this time. Um, but you will be welcome to send feedback in written form, um, you know, after this as well. And Elena will provide that information shortly.
the time is currently currently 2.25. So I think it'd be appropriate if we just waited about two more minutes. So at 2.27, okay. we'll go ahead and, and wrap up this stakeholder meeting if there are no further comments. Okay, so far I'm not seeing anything else. Again, folks, feel free to send any comments or questions in the questions pane or use the raise your hand feature. Otherwise, we'll just hang on and then Elena will wrap up here in about two minutes. I'm going to wait for about another minute more, so please let us know if you have any last minute questions, comments using the questions pane or the raise your hand feature. And again, if you think of something after this, Elena will be providing contact information for you to submit emailed written comments as well, but we'd appreciate any feedback you have at this time. And just to clarify, um, we were earlier, we were telling stakeholders, like, if you have specific feedback, we'd like that. I mean, we do appreciate specific feedback. Um, but even if you have just a, a simple comment of either you support these changes or you don't support these changes and you don't think they should be made permanent, um, like I said earlier, we're just really trying to get a feel for what the public wants. And so any any indication of which way the public would like to see these rules go, whether they drop off in 120 days um, that they're supposed to as emergency rules or or you do want them permanent. We just we're just trying to get feedback. So all right. I have a written I have a written comment from Kate Chambers um, that I'm gonna read. So as COVID-19 continues to unfold, I would be in favor of continuing the temporary mandate to create an adaptable healthcare workforce that could, number one, move between states as well as, number two, allow new graduates the opportunity to get clinical hours. Uh, and Kate Chambers notes that she is an OTR slash L. I'm not familiar with the terminology, I apologize. Uh, she's a traveling therapist license in, uh, it looks like Washington, Wyoming, and Colorado. Um, so Kate Chambers, thank you for sending your comment. Um, and that has been noted and will be provided during consideration. Okay. Do we have any any more comments? So. That is the only comment I see at this time, and no hands are currently raised. All right. So we'll go ahead and wrap up the stakeholder meeting. So thank you for participating in today's meeting. The stakeholder comments and program recommendations will be presented to the director prior to the formal rulemaking hearings. Those hearings are tentatively scheduled between August 25th and August 26th. More information regarding the, the exact dates or the exact times and the location information will be provided to all stakeholders and licensees, and it'll also be posted on the board's website. So that concludes today's stakeholder meeting. If you do find that you have um, comments that you want to type um, send to the division, you can send all those comments to Dora underscore DPO underscore rulemaking as all one word at state.co.us and that email address was also provided on the notice for today's meeting as well. So thank you and I am going to end the webinar.